Why are we fascinated by the crystal skulls? They are made of pure quartz crystal, one of the hardest substances known to man. But who made them? Are these mysterious, wonderful works of art truly ancient? Or are they modern? My name is David Hatcher Childress, and I'm an archaeologist, and an investigator, and an author. I write books about archaeological mysteries. I first became interested in the crystal skulls, and the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull especially, when I went down to Central America, and to Guatemala and Belize, and to the lost city of Lubantun, which is the Mayan city where supposedly the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull was first discovered. Quartz crystals are amazing receptors for energy. A quartz crystal is a tetrahedral lattice of silicon atoms, and it is done by nature in a sense that you have these perfect rows of silicon atoms in a layer, just like a silicon computer chip. And in fact, we're using quartz crystals in all kinds of computers and high technology. NASA does experiments where they grow crystals in space because they want perfect quartz crystals. The military and IBM and Hewlett Packard have done studies where they take a quartz crystal and they encode information in it uh, like a DVD or a CD and they use lasers and they put holograms inside of quartz crystals and later they can retrieve that information. In our research in anthropology and oriental science throughout the world the crystal skulls are seen in the tankas, they're seen in the ancient uh, sutra texts as, shall we say, the quintessence of how the mind of the crystal represents the invisible world of information that converges with the human. The crystal has always fascinated all cultures of the world, particularly even in the Hispanic traditions where there was intermarriage between the Spanish conquistadors and the families such as the Zapotec, the Aztec, etc. There was a ceremonial process where the crystal was exchanged as the information symbol of great beauty, great knowledge, an ancient mystical connection with the universe. And I believe that intuitive feelings that we all have for these fantastic, beautiful crystal skulls from all directions, from all cultures, suggest that the crystal skull represents really the mirroring of the inner psyche as well as the vibratory basis of the future psyche as it goes into a new embodiment, a new story of creation, a new aspect of the Adamic experience of life on Mother Earth. So, any quartz crystal, whether it's a pure quartz crystal that's perhaps worn on a pendant on your neck, or is carved into a crystal skull, or a crystal ball, or it could be a crystal rabbit or something like that, but the inherent ability of quartz crystal is that it can store information and interact with the human brain. So the idea that a crystal skull or any quartz crystal can be absorbing information, uh, what's happening around it, perhaps a psychic interaction between the humans and their crystal, this is genuinely happening. I mean, scientists know that quartz crystals can do this kind of a thing. Probably the most famous of all crystal skulls is the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, now owned by Bill Holman. Anne Mitchell Hedges claimed that she discovered the crystal skull in the ruins of an ancient Mayan city in the jungles of Belize, then British Honduras. But others claim that her adopted father, Mike Mitchell Hedges, had already acquired the skull before that, or even later, during an auction. Probably the most famous of all the crystal skulls is the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, which is now owned by Bill Holman. Holman was willed the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull after Anna Mitchell Hedges passed away at 100 years old in 2007. Anna claimed that she had discovered the crystal skull 
in the ruins of this ancient Mayan city in the jungles of British Honduras, now called Belize. But others have doubted her claims, and they think that her father, Mike Mitchell Hedges, somehow had acquired the skull previously. So when you're around the crystal skull, there's, there's like miracles that happen all the time. So it's kind of a, it's a neat thing. Uh, miracles in people that come to see it. Uh, miracles that, uh, you know, that things, the way they fall into place and things that happen. And uh, uh, we, I call it the skull of love now. You know, it was skull of doom or whatever. That was more or less, there was a reason for that back when it was, but the skull of love, because it works on your heart chakra, it opens your heart to that uh, universal type love. And the, the world needs that real bad right now. And that's what, what it's doing. It's working it on people to realize that we're all connected, we're all apart. And, uh, and that's, you know, the skulls have come out for a reason. That's what they're here for. And the Mitchell Hedges skull is right up there doing that. Very clearly, if we look at the overall history of crystal skulls and the way they are, they are cut, particularly the Mitchell Hedges crystal skulls and the examination made by Dr. Frank Dorlin and my late colleague, Dr. Marcel Vogel, it is clear that the refinements of the crystal, the optical properties, and the fact that so many cultures throughout the world have illustrated that the crystal skulls as some type of biotransducer for the processing of energy or optical property suggests that it is indeed a byproduct of high technology. Well, I met Sammy Mitchell Hedges back in the early 80s. I think it was like 81. And what it was is that it was a, something that happened to me even way before that is where I got connected to the skull. It was uh, I, when I was in the service uh, down in Panama. And uh, I, I traveled around and went to the different islands and stuff. And there was this one island uh, called Taboga. And the, the lady that owned the hotel there and restaurant used to know Sammy and her father. And they used to come in when they were fishing for shark in that area and told me stories about them. And it's, that kind of stuck in my mind. And, and I, at the same time, about that same period, I saw a picture in one of the books of the Crystal Skull. And there was a real connection there. I knew that I really wanted to see it, but you know, you just kind of goes out of your mind. And, and it was probably like, oh heck, 25, or let's see, probably 10 years later, 12 years later, uh, someone told me about uh, Anna Mitchell Hedges living in Canada and I happened to get a number so I just called up there and here's here she is inviting me up to visit and see the skull and and uh, I just uh, took advantage of it went up there and and right off from the bat it was uh, Anna and her uh, secretary Cynthia and they were just some of the neatest people I've ever met and we became really good friends and uh, over the years after that uh, I would be able to travel with them. they go on different trips all over and I was the one that could take them around. And, and back in the 90s, she spent two years living with me. And so uh, we, we were good friends for a lot of years. Now the one crystal skull which is the most written about and the most controversial is the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. I saw that skull in 1988 and was able to spend a few hours with it. When I first saw that skull, first of all, totally impressed on the carving itself. It's, exquisitely carved, it's a priceless work of art, an almost pure optical grade quartz with only one slight occlusion on the top of the head, the only defect in the skull, otherwise it's as clear as glass. Tremendous energy, tremendous scenes. Now there's tremendous information in that skull. So when I first got involved with the Mitchell Hedges Crystal Skull, I came to the conclusion that it was an ancient artifact. However, since then, opinions have changed. Who was Mike Mitchell Hedges? Well, he was born in Britain in 1882, and he was destined for a life of adventure. He left for America in 1899 when he was only 17 years old, and he worked in New York and Montreal. He played poker with J.P. Morgan and his friends. Then he went down to Mexico to ride around with Pancho Villa. In fact, that was one of his books called Prisoner of Pancho Villa. And it seemed like he was having good fun, having adventures. Then Mitchell Hedges turned up in British Honduras and at the lost city of Lubanton in 1924. There, he helped in the excavations of that ancient city with Dr. Thomas Gann and his sponsor, a woman named Lady Richmond Brown. Thomas Gann described uh, some of their adventures in his book, 
Mystery Cities on how he was joined by Mitchell Hedges and Lady Richmond Brown. Thomas Gann described the excavations of Lubanton in his 1924 book, Mystery Cities of the Maya. But what's curious about Thomas Gann and Mike Mitchell Hedges and then Lady Richmond Brown, who was Mitchell Hedges' sponsor, is that all of these people wrote a number of books and it was all about Lubanton and their adventures in Central America Yet, in none of these books was there ever any mention of the famous crystal skull. You would think that if the crystal skull had been found in the ruins of Lubanton by Sammy Mitchell Hedges on her birthday in 1924, as she claimed, that there would be photographs of this. Even they would at least mention it in one of their many books, but they don't. The first mention of the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull only comes in Mike Mitchell Hedges' final book, Danger My Ally, which was published in 1954. And in that book, Mike Mitchell Hedges doesn't say that Sammy found the skull on her birthday at Lubanton. In fact, what he says is that he has good reason for not telling the reader how he acquired the skull. So Mitchell Hedges is himself creating more of an enigma by being very secretive of the origin of the famous Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. The Mitchell Hedges skull is it's, uh, anatomically correct. You know, they did tests on it back in the 90s and they, with a forensic team and they put skin and muscle on it and they determined that it was a, 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 a female between 25 and 29 of Mesoamerican uh, descent. And they said it was like an ancient, one more of the ancient skulls of, of that. So that's the area that they, that's the way they determined. So that's one thing, it's anatomically correct. There's no other skulls that are anatomically correct. And also the fact is that it's in two pieces and that's what makes it really special. Yeah, you know, they've, made tests on other skulls and they try to determine you know where they came from and how they were made and there's all this different talk but uh, when it comes to right down to the bottom line when you have when you say hey it's in two pieces it's not able to be made they even would have trouble even doing it today uh, okay how was it made <laughs> somebody did it F.A. Mike Mitchell Hedges was really a fascinating character. Uh, in, in many ways, he really was the model for Indiana Jones and, and combined with James Bond, in fact. After his adventures in Mexico with Pancho Villa in 1914, Mike Mitchell Hedges returned to England. Then he suddenly showed up in Canada again, and that's where he adopted young Anna, who later became Sammy Mitchell Hedges and the owner of the Crystal Skull. They journeyed to California, he put her up on a boarding school, and then he went down to Mexico and Honduras. And for the next several years, he traveled in Danger My Ally. He says that he set out on a task of rediscovering Central America, and that during those years, he traveled to Spanish Honduras and Guatemala and Nicaragua and San Salvador. He then returned to England again in 1920. Then his mistress and sponsor, the wealthy lady Richmond Brown, had been told by doctors that uh, she was not well and needed to rest. She instead bought a yacht for Mike Mitchell Hedges and the two of them set off for the Caribbean. So in 1921, Lady Richmond Brown and Mike Mitchell Hedges, plus their secretary, Jane Harvey Hulson, who wrote a book called Blue Blaze, they set off to the islands of Honduras, the San Blas Islands of Panama, and they sailed around Jamaica for a while. Mitchell Hedges wrote a couple of books about this, one called Land of Fear and Wonder. In these books, he was a deep sea fisherman. He was constantly searching for Atlantis. In fact, Mitchell Hedges and Lady Richmond Brown believed that the Bay Area's Honduras had sunken cities in it. 
They believe that there was the remains of a highly advanced civilization underwater there, and they thought it was Atlantis. Mitchell Hedges had this penchant for Atlantis and mystical sciences, secret societies, and he was constantly writing these articles that would appear in New York papers about how he had discovered Atlantis and other evidence of ancient civilizations. A California journalist and occultist named Sibley Morel suggested in a 1972 book about Mitchell Hedges and the Crystal Skull that Mitchell Hedges had acquired this crystal skull from Pancho Villa and somehow through Porfirio Diaz, who was the long-term dictator of Mexico. They theorized that these crystal skulls had been handed down from the Aztec times and even from the Zapotecs and other early civilizations. The skull motif is a very common one in Mexico. And even today in museums in Mexico City, you can see small crystal skulls on display. Morio was fascinated by the turn of the century journalist Ambrose Bierce. After some years of study, and in the 60s, there was a resurgence of interest in the Mitchell Hedges skull. Moril decided that the Mexican revolutions of the late 1800s and the early 1900s had caused some of these special crystal skulls held in this secret treasure trove of the presidents had made it into other people's hands, including Mike Mitchell Hedges. In 1931, Mitchell Hedges published his only novel, a book called White Tiger. White Tiger is a fun, fast-paced adventure of self-sacrifice and good character, qualities that were important at that time. Mitchell Hedges in White Tiger talks about being shown a secret city in the, in the jungles of Central America somewhere. In White Tiger, he's shown an ancient Aztec city, he claims. He is the White Tiger. In that book, Mitchell Hedges is shown a treasure vault in this lost Aztec city. And in this treasure vault, he says, in this 1931 book, that there were crystal skulls as part of this treasure. So you have to wonder, is Mitchell Hedges in the book White Tiger hinting that he had acquired this crystal skull at a lost city in the jungle that he was shown? Or perhaps he had gotten it from Pancho Villa. Sammy Mitchell Hedges was to claim that she found the skull in Lubanton on her birthday in 1924. And still others claim that Mitchell Hedges actually acquired the skull at an auction in London. Yeah, it was, uh, it was found on her 17th birthday, and, uh, and uh, it's like a day she said she'll never forget. But, uh, you know, not knowing, you know, knowing how he was, you know, he worked for the British Secret Service. Uh, there was a lot of things in his life that he could not really bring out or tell. And uh, you know, so there's, a, you know, where the speculation comes in there, it's pretty, that makes it very, uh, interesting story but yeah to, would it be possible he could have put it there for her to find that well that is a possibility you know uh, he, he was uh, into so many different things and his you know and a lot of the things he did you know wasn't really something he could report so to say where it came from if it was found by you know her at that spot well that's that's a good possibility but uh, and I'm gonna stay with that because that's what she said and I you know I believe what she said but there's, you know, there's so many different variables in there. It could, could have come anyway. In Danger, My Ally, Mitchell Hedges says of a 1947 trip that we took with us also the sinister skull of doom of which much has been written. How it came into my possession, I have reason for not revealing. The skull of doom is made of pure rock crystal and according to scientists, it must have taken over 150 years generation after generation, working all the days of their lives, patiently rubbing down with sand an immense block of 
rock crystal till finally the perfect crystal skull emerged. It is at least 3,600 years old, said Mitchell Hedges, and according to legend, it was used by the high priest of the Maya when performing esoteric rites. It is said that when, the, when he willed death with the help of the skull, death invariably followed, said Mitchell Hedges. Mitchell Hedges said the skull has been described as the embodiment of all evil. Then he said, I do not wish to try to explain these phenomena. The popular story of the discovery of the Mitchell Hedges skull, that it took place at a later period of excavations in Lubanton, and that it was in 1927 actually, that Anna supposedly was digging in a collapsed altar and and an adjoining wall, and then she discovered this life-size crystal skull on her 17th birthday. Three months later, a matching jawbone was discovered, they said. So, here we have one of the strangest ancient objects that ever came to the attention of the world. But in fact, nothing was said until many years afterward. You know, and I'm not a person that takes everything as face value. I like to, I like to know the, you know, where it really comes from. And uh, I found with Sammy that she never wavered from what she believed. Now, there's all these different stories about where it came from and how it came from. And uh, to me, that's, it's really a blessing because, you know, if it was everybody knew exactly where it came from, then I might be really having a trouble with somebody that would want it to go back to some place where they thought it should be. So with all these different stories, it's really helping me out quite a bit. So I like the stories, but I believe what Sammy said because she's never, never wavered from one, you know, some of those times the stories are just a little bit different, but you know, you figure, you know, I have uh, trouble remembering back 10 years, 15 years, and here she's remembering back 70 or 80 years. Now that's, that's pretty amazing for anybody. But uh, uh, as far as the basic thing, she found it in Luban too. Now, did her father plant it there? Well, that's a possibility, you know, and uh, it, he was a very interesting and very special person too. Now, some of the claims of these crystal skulls being modern carved, that they were carved in Germany. Now, this particularly comes into play with the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. Now, as I said, many of us originally thought it was ancient and have since changed our minds and particularly Mr. Nick Nocerino, who I considered the absolute expert in the field. He had studied the crystal, Mitchell Hedges crystal skull in Canada for several weeks, had interviewed Anna Mitchell Hedges, recorded interviews with her, and found that her story was not consistent. She kept changing the story. I found, personally, when I interviewed Anna Mitchell Hedges in 1988, she told three different versions of how she found the skull and three different years. Uh, it led us to a conclusion that, that, first of all, Anna Mitchell Hedges' story of being at Lubentun and finding the skull there is a complete fabrication. We document that in the book that I've, ri I've written, in the chapters that I speak of. Uh, she was not there in 1924, as she claimed. The only time she could have been there was in 1927. However, every other member of the expedition, which was called the Gann Expedition, led by Dr. Thomas Gann, not by Mike Mitchell Hedges, none of them ever mentioned the find of a crystal skull. There's no corroboration of anyone who was ever at the site or there that that skull was ever there. So we began to doubt the story. In doubting the story then, some of us maybe began to doubt the skull itself. In particular, Mr. Nocerino was convinced in the late 90s that the Mitchell Hedges skull had been carved in a city called Oberstein, Germany. It's now called Ider Oberstein, it's a, a dual city. But in 1850, 1860, Oberstein, Germany was the leading carvers of quartz crystal in the world. And a lot of German adventurers at that time were going into South America and Central America, in particular Brazil, where we think the type of quartz that the Mitchell Hedges skull is carved from came from Brazil. There's only a few areas in the world where there's that pure optical grade quartz that the Mitchell Hedges skull was carved from, and one is Brazil. So Nick Nocerino was convinced before he passed away in 2004 that the Mitchell Hedges skull had been carved in Oberstein, Germany in 1850 or 1860. Now I always have to ask, add the major caveat when I discuss these things is that we can't prove this. We can't prove yet that the Hedges skull was carved there. However, there are carved crystal skulls coming out of Oberstein today, which are fine quality. Now, to answer those that say that we cannot duplicate, we could not carve 
the Mitchell Hedges gold today, I answered definitely in the negative. We can carve it today. There are master carvers who could carve that skull today. There are carvings of skulls today with a detachable jaw like the Hedges skull, which are as fine a quality as the Mitchell Hedges skull. So it's, it's, I can't say definitively, but I lean to the opinion now that the Mitchell Hedges skull is not ancient, but old. In order to make a life-sized or near-life-sized crystal skull, the crystal carvers would need a pretty large piece of quartz. Some quartz crystals can reach several meters in length and weigh tons. Obtaining large translucent quartz crystals could be very difficult, especially in ancient times. Deposits of large crystals of different grades occur in Brazil, Peru, Mexico, California, Arkansas, and other areas of the Americas. Deposits are also found in Africa, Europe, and Asia. But the finest quality translucent quartz crystals come from Brazil. I learned a tremendous amount of information from Nick Nocerino. I consider Mr. Nocerino to have been the foremost researcher of crystal skulls. Uh, he, he showed us how to activate skulls, how to scry. Scrying is an ancient term which we call today crystal gazing. That is to look into a crystal to be able to see scenes. He demonstrated deep breathing techniques as well as the use of toning, chanting, to, as to go into the crystal as it said. So Nick Nocerino taught us a tremendous amount how to work with crystal, how to work with crystal skulls, and how to activate the information that's stored in the crystal skulls. Getting involved with the crystal skull and how I first met Nick Nocerino was in 1983, I got involved with another crystal skull known as the Amethyst Crystal Skull, and I had heard about Mr. F.R. Nick Nocerino in 1980 when I first got involved with the first crystal skull, which we called the Mayan Crystal Skull. It was actually Nick Nocerino's uh, students who named it that because they saw Mayan scenes in it. I had heard about him, knew that he was an expert in the subject, but I didn't contact him until 1983 when I first got to meet him, watch him work with, an am with the amethyst crystal skull, and learn from him. One of the stories that I talk about in the book that I've written is, is Nick Nocerino's visions when he was a child. Uh, first of all, Nick Nocerino born extremely sensitive, was born into a family of metaphysical background. His maternal grandmother was a Wiccan high priestess and, uh, uh, and, and introduced him to her coven and they taught him how to use crystals from the age of seven. So he was versed in the use of crystals. At the age of nine, when he was going up his house to the upper floor of his house in Brooklyn, New York, he saw in a mirror at the top of the stairs a vision of a crystal skull. He then looked at it, not becoming frightened because of his training and background in Wicca, he saw a, a snake, a cobra, come out of one eye, then disappear. Then he saw another cobra come out of the second eye and disappear. And then he saw a jaguar come out of one eye. And he heard the words in his mind, the order of the jaguar. And he never forgot that. And this came in very handy later when he sent an agent of his to Mexico to seek out crystal skulls, to actually use that term that he was seeking out the order of the jaguar. And sure enough, this gentleman got in touch with a priest and a whole coven and a whole group of people who called mentalistas in Spanish, mentalists, and they had a bunch of crystal skulls. So we know for a fact that the, order, the group of Mayans that work with crystal skulls, one of them is the Order of the Jaguar. I consider the late Nick Nasrino a brother in the area of parapsychology and paraphysics. He was one of the great investigators not only in the analysis of what we will call other states of consciousness and communication, but his very deep appreciation he had for ancient crystal artifacts and his intuition suggesting that there was once a whole library of information somehow connected with signal processing of, shall we say, crystal skulls that we need to know more about. Back in the 1970s, while working in Oaxaca, Mexico, a colleague of mine in civil engineering came across a cache of small crystal skulls and uh, I felt an immediate attraction to the paraphysical aspects of healing properties of the crystal skulls. I shared this with a colleague, uh, Dr. Marla in Mexico City, 
who was uniquely known for her ability to take small crystalline objects and place them along the meridians of the human body that she was using for healing properties. And so, yes, I've had some very unique aspects of crystals in the context of paraphysical healing. There, there's some unusual properties to it that I don't think that we really understand. There's, maybe there's a scientific reason for it, but uh, it's just how certain things happen. Like if you take a picture of it, you never know what might be in that picture. That's the kind of, you know, you get, you know, pictures of future, past, and it's pretty amazing. I took a picture of it once when it was sitting on a picnic table outside, and it turned into a baby's head. And I don't know how that happened. I have that picture, and it's like, how, <laughs> that's a different one. But it, and I don't know what it was telling me on that one. <laughs> Imagine this as a possible scenario for using the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. You're a visitor to a Mayan temple, and you're brought one at a time inside the inner sanctum by a Mayan priest. As you enter into the temple, you see on an altar a glowing crystal skull. It's life size. You're amazed. And as you stare at it, incredibly, it begins to move and talk. You actually see the jawbone moving on the crystal skull. A priest is hidden beneath the floor. He does the talking. He tells you, okay, you know, give lots of money to the temple and, and uh, support us on your way out. You're amazingly impressed by this glowing, talking crystal skull, and you've seen it with your own eyes. This is the kind of thing that could have occurred with the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, and perhaps this was its purpose. It is a fascinating idea that various emperors, presidents, governors of Mexico may have used crystal skulls as oracles and implements of power. Mexico is a nation steeped in the occult, witchcraft, and skull worship. Presidents of Mexico, especially the dictator Porfirio Diaz, may have included crystal skulls as part of their arsenal of, of magic talismans. These magical skulls were said to wield the power of death and woe to those that they were used against. Like using a crystal ball or something like that to make black magic on somebody, in theory you could use these crystal skulls to do a similar thing. Many researchers believed that both Ambrose Bierce, who mysteriously vanished in Mexico in 1914, and Mitchell Hedges were spies for the American and British governments, that they had been sent to Mexico during those turbulent revolutionary years to find out what the revolutionaries planned, to see what was happening in Mexico at the time. Britain was switching its fleet over from coal to oil during this period, and nearly all of the oil from the British fleet was coming from the oil fields in Mexico. Protecting British interests in Mexico was of the utmost importance. And it quite seems that Mitchell Hedges was on some kind of British spying mission. And it's amazing to think that during this spy mission in Mexico, he somehow acquired the famous Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. Now there are stories that go with the crystal skulls and that when they started coming out was in the mid 19th century. In particular, the Austrian Emperor Maximilian had conquered Mexico in the 1850s and 1860s. A lot of soldiers of fortune from Germany, from the continent, European continent, came into Mexico. There was a lot of looting of tombs then, of Mayan tombs, Olmec tombs, and a lot of these crystal skulls did appear. It is believed that some of these skulls were sold by soldiers of fortune from Maximilian's time to Tiffany's in New York, which wound their way to the British Museum. The British Museum skull is one which may have come out. There are others which are believed may have been in a personal collection of the Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz in 1910. The story that we had about the amethyst crystal skull that I worked with, that it had been a paperweight on the desk of Porfirio Diaz. We have no evidence, no proof of this. Supposedly someone told us there was a photograph of Diaz with his collection of crystal skulls. I, the photograph has never been seen. I've never seen that. So it is a legend, it is a story that the, Emperor, the Mexican dictator Diaz had looted tombs, had gotten some of these crystal skulls, and had used them. 
And so that is a story that we passed down. And some of these skulls did come. Some of the skulls that may have come to museums in Europe may have come out of the Diaz collection. As far as some of the other crystal skulls that I've observed, I've seen at least four that I would classify as ancient artifacts. Maybe, maybe as many as nine, if we include the Mitchell Hedges skull. There was the Mayan crystal skull, the Amethyst crystal skull, and in particular, Max, the Texas crystal skull, and Shana Ra, the Noserino skull, are, in my opinion, genuine ancient artifacts. Now, how I've come to that opinion is detailed study of the skull, which we look at the carving, we look at the grains, we look at the teeth, and if they're uneven, if the carving and the polish is uneven, then it was not done with power, power tools. Max, in particular, could not possibly have been carved by modern tools because Max is made of five different sections of quartz which are fused together under tremendous heat and pressure. A well-known great geologist and natural scientist from Boston University, Dr. Robert M. Schock, who's been involved with John Anthony West in redating the age of the Sphinx, looked at Max and he said without a doubt that if any power tools had been applied to Max, he would have shattered into five sections. So there's no doubt that at least for two, for certain, Max and Shana Ra are genuine ancient artifacts. I also think the, the Mayan skull, the Amethyst skull, protect, particularly other couple of skulls that we know called Madre, um, Rainbow, Czar, and E.T. may be ancient artifacts. Nick Nocerino had reported to me that he had seen as many as 15 to 18 skulls in his lifetime that he classified as genuine ancient artifacts. Uh, there are more, many more, more than 13. In my opinion, you know, what I feel and what I've seen, I think this is the main skull. I think it was the one that was brought from Atlantis or from whatever. That's my opinion. And I base that on being around it and the different experiences I've felt with it and the things that I've, you know, have worked with it. It's a, it's not just, it's not a, it's a crystal, but it's an entity, it's a life form. And you can feel that energy and that life when you're around it. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty neat thing. In my book entitled The Book of Knowledge, Keys of Enoch, I have an illustration which encompasses that area I call the Guatemala Triangle, which is from Kalamakuyu, the ancient city area of Guatemala, all the way to the Yucatan Peninsula, all the way across southernmost part of Mexico. And in this area, along the alignments with Guatemala, we have seen a great plethora of crystalline materials. It is well known that much of this crystalline technology originally came from the area of Oaxaca and moved across the area of the Yucatan. So it is clear if we read the culture myths that there was crystalline centers of knowledge. The crystal skull that's now kept at the Smithsonian Institution is also said to have come from the Porfirio Diaz collection of crystal skulls. And a letter was sent anonymously to the Smithsonian with the crystal skull saying, Dear Sir, this Aztec crystal skull is purported to be part of the Porfirio Diaz collection, and it was purchased in Mexico City in 1960. I am offering it to the Smithsonian Institution without any consideration. Naturally, I wish to remain anonymous. This skull is sometimes said to be the largest and the ugliest of all the crystal skulls. It weighs 32 pounds and is made of a cloudy quartz crystal and has a smooth finish, but its features seem to be crudely executed. When the Smithsonian National Museum of American History tried to track down the donor, they discovered that he was dead. In fact, after he sent the skull to the museum, his lawyer said that his client committed suicide. After his client bought the skull and his wife died and his son had a terrible accident that left him brain dead, the man then went bankrupt. He believed that this crystal skull acquired in Mexico was somehow cursed. Early on, some of the staff at the Smithsonian also believed that this was a cursed crystal skull. Then some tests were done in London, and in the last few years, a number of famous crystal skulls have been tested by the Smithsonian and the British Museum. The tests were observed by the Smithsonian's Jane Walsh, and they determined that the Mitchell Hedges skull and the Smithsonian skull and the skull in the British Museum had all been made with modern tools. 
Walsh said, we've discovered that all the crystal skulls that they examined have been carved with modern coated lapidary wheels using industrial diamonds and, and machinery for polishing. So now we're faced with an enigma with the famous crystal skulls like the Mitchell Hedges one. And that is, can they still be modern forgeries made in like the late 1800s? But could they also have been acquired from Mexico, from the Porfirio Diaz collection or something like that? And in fact, that is possible. It's quite possible that these skulls were originally made in Germany, some of these skulls, and then were brought to Mexico, sold as treasures to Mexican presidents and other wealthy collectors. And then these skulls made it back to Europe and into museums where they were said to be Aztec or Mixtec or Mayan skulls. The president of Mexico at the turn of the century was Porfirio Diaz. Diaz was part Mixtec, which probably made him appreciate crystal skulls and, and other uh, motifs uh, as much as any Mexican president would. Porfirio Diaz was born on September 15, 1830, in the city of Oaxaca. His father was a modern innkeeper in the city, but he died when Porfirio was only three years old. His mother tried to keep this end going, but it failed. She sent the young boy to the seminary and he became a priest. Later, he rebelled against the church authority and he joined the military. He became very successful in the military and ultimately became the president of Mexico. It's during this time that Mexican Revolution broke out and suddenly crystal skulls were disseminated throughout Mexico. And it's possibly at this time that Mike Mitchell Hedges acquired the famous Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. Uh, there are other crystal skulls that I've worked with. We call them the Mayan crystal skull, the Amethyst crystal skull, and then there's Max, which is known as the Texas crystal skull. I first saw Max in 1989, met Joanne and Carl Parks, who are his caretaker's owners. Max is an amazing crystal skull, uh, probably the largest of the ancient ones that we know of, 18 pounds, 2 ounces, very ancient, very roughly made, unevenly carved, no doubt carved by hand, not by tools. And Max, in particular, has probably become my favorite. I've spent over 100 plus hours in research on Max. There's no doubt that Max is ancient, has much knowledge and information, has done healings, and uh, Max is just a tremendous and a genuine ancient artifact. Now, how I've come to that opinion is detailed study of the skull, which we look at the carving, we look at the grains, we look at the teeth, and if they're uneven, if the carving and the polish is uneven, then it was not done with power, power tools. Max, in particular, could not possibly have been carved by modern tools because Max is made of five different sections of quartz which are fused together under tremendous heat and pressure. The well-known great geologist and natural scientist from Boston University, Dr. Robert M. Schock, who's been involved with John Anthony West in redating the age of the Sphinx, looked at Max and he said without a doubt that if any power tools had been applied to Max, he would have shattered into five sections. So there's no doubt that at least for two, for certain, Max and Shana Ra are genuine ancient artifacts. I also think the, the Mayan skull, the Amethyst skull, protect, particularly other couple of skulls that we know called Madre, um, Rainbow, Czar, and E.T. may be ancient artifacts. Nick Nocerino had reported to me that he had seen as many as 15 to 18 skulls in his lifetime that he classified as genuine ancient artifacts. Uh, there are more, many more, more than 13, that's for sure. Yeah, I've seen the, uh, the, the pictures of the British Museum skull. I've never seen it in person, which I'd really like to do, but uh, uh, looking at the skull and the shape and the weight, uh, they're very, very similar. And uh, one of the reasons I had the skull tested at the Smithsonian recently, because I, I knew how those people are. And they have their very, they can see probably as long as their nose and no farther than that. So I knew that what they had in their mind and what they wanted to do. 
So they tested it exactly the same way that they tested the British Museum skull. I think the British Museum skull is a very, very old and very special skull. And uh, by what I want to do, by bringing this, by having tested the Mitchell Hedges skull, I want them to reevaluate and realize that that skull should be honored for what it is. It's a very, very old, very uh, powerful, very special skull. Even if they have put it in one inch glass for over 70 years and it's now it's very cloudy because it need, needs the oxygen, it needs air like a, to breathe, but you know, that's what they've done to it. But now it's still, a, you know, it's very powerful. It's a very beautiful skull. And you know, I want, by testing the Mitchell Hedges skull and they say, oh, there's some tool marks. And then that would be fine if it was a one piece skull. But when it comes to the fact it's a two piece skull and there's no way in technology that it could be duplicated, now you're gonna say, okay, oh yeah, it was made with dentist drills in, in, in uh, 1900 or 1910, uh, that right. I'd like to see anybody do it today with, te with laser technology and be able to do it. It's, it's an impossible thing. Now how these crystal skulls are manufactured today is with modern power tools, with high, high frequency drills that have diamond tips because quartz, which is seven on the Mohs scale, M-O-H-S, which is the scale how they, they rate the hardness of stone, diamond of course being 10, quartz being uh, uh, seven, so that you have to have something high, harder, seven or higher to carve it. Usually diamond tip drills, usually coated lapidary wheels to carve the teeth, and that's how they're done today with high speed carving. But the ancient ones, we are convinced, were carved by hand. How is a, is a question, is still a mystery. It would take a master shaman and carver to have done that by hand. And it's believed to have been polished with a diamond or sand grit to smooth it. But clearly the ancient ones have uneven polishing, which shows that they were done by hand. There is a popular legend that there are supposed to be 13 life-size crystal skulls, which when they're brought together would create some sort of a power matrix. In light of how these legends travel around the world, one wonders if, if this is one that was possibly started by Porfirio Diaz, that there were 13 crystal skulls as part of his collection. Some people think that these large crystal skulls, like the Mitchell Hedges skull, the London skull, that these were three of the famous 13 skulls that will ultimately be brought together, as Mayan legends supposedly say. Okay, the 13 crystal skulls, that's the Mayan legend, and the Mayans believe that there are uh, the one skull, and then the Mayans, they created 12 other skulls using the center skull as a, as a, uh, uh, something that they copied, and the 12 skulls are uh, made by the gods, that was what they believe. And they say that the skulls, when put in the proper alignment, and it'll, it has to do with peace on the planet. And it has very much connection with this 2012 period that we're coming into. So it's, they say it's very important that the, these skulls are found, brought out, and uh, that, that this alignment happens. I do feel that uh, the, sc this, the skulls are being called something through them is being called because I feel this is happening and now with the shows that we're doing the, the sci-fi going all over the world people are seeing it and it's affecting some part of their heart or mind and these skulls are going to be found and brought out is what I feel. Now there is a story that is prevailing that you'll see in all books written about crystal skulls all specials that come out crystal skulls that there is a legend of 13 original crystal skulls which must come together for the sake of humanity. Now it must be said that no one was talking about this legend before the 1970s, before Nick Nocerino started to give lectures and talked about a vision he had as a youth of 13 crystal skulls. All of us, including myself and many others who have worked with crystal skulls, have saw, seen the vision of 12 skulls in a circle, one master skull in the middle, 13 skulls. 
but we never heard about these legends. All of a sudden now you have the story that there's a Mayan legend of 13 crystal skulls, there's a Native American legend of 13 skulls, we've told it is a Tibetan legend of 13 skulls. None of this, these stories ever came out from Mayan wisdom keepers or any of the indigenous keepers before the phenomenon of crystal skulls is hit. So I do not believe that there is 13 original skulls. As I said, Nick Nocerino investigated as many as 15 to 18 that he thinks are ancient. I think there's sets of 13. Sets of 12, all different colors. A ruby red, a lapis blue, a, a jade green or an emerald green, a citrine yellow and a golden, a, a, an amethyst purple, a, a smoky dark black, all different colors with a master skull in the center. But I think there's sets of 13. So this whole idea that's been very prevalent in the literature now that there are 13 original skulls that have to come together for the sake of humanity, I think is things that have been channeled through from people with wishful thinking. Uh, there's no doubt that the skulls are here to come together to help humanity. There's no doubt, we all see that. So we don't disagree with that. But that there's 13 specific skulls that have to come out by 2012 because it's a Mayan legend. The Mayans never talked about these things until just the last 20 years. The Mayans who worked with crystal skulls kept it very private. They didn't share it too many with, with whites or with gringos or with outsiders. Only if they trusted you into the inner circle of the Mayan shamans initiates did anyone ever know about crystal skulls past the last 50 to 100 years. It was only kept by the Mayans themselves, kept in secret. So they wouldn't have told these stories that there were. And I don't believe, I'm gonna be connecting with some Mayan shamans and we're gonna investigate this further, but I don't believe that there is written down in any Codex, like the Popo Vu, that there is 13 original Mayan crystal skulls that have to come together before 2012. So we can see that the search for crystal skulls is an amazing story. It's, it's one peppered with occult things and poker players and adventures and a collection of ancient crystal skulls. We, we've got crooked art dealers selling to museums. We've got Mexican revolutionaries and even lost Mayan cities in the Central American jungles. Yet with all this stuff, uh, the, what we know about crystal skulls is, is only just beginning to emerge. Their crystal skulls are just so amazing. In the brief association I had with Frank Dorlin and others who came to IBM in Northern California back in the early 70s, Frank felt clearly the crystals represented what could be called an Atlantean civilization. Uh, this word has been kicked around. It is basically an archetypal expression for previous civilization along the Atlantic that would have very advanced laser systems or the use of crystalline technology systems that would advance the cause of human evolution development. Clearly, Frank Dorland was on the right track and devoted most of his life to what he believed to be an artifact connecting present humankind with an earlier Atlantean type civilization. Crystal skulls are evidence really that ancient civilizations had some sort of high technology. If some of these crystal skulls are genuinely ancient and there's some evidence now coming from the Smithsonian and the British Museum that cast doubt on many of the crystal skulls being genuinely ancient. But I think that some crystal skulls really are ancient. But it, this is the problem. Could ancient civilizations, could the Mayans or the Aztecs have the technology, the hard tools, diamond dust, diamond drills, diamond saws to have made uh, crystal skulls? Quartz crystal is so difficult to work with. It's not something to be done by uh, primitive means, really. Yet, we know that the ancient Zapotecs and Mixtecs, uh, probably the Olmecs, made crystal skulls. If you go to the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City today, you will see a few very small crystal skulls in the museum. How are they made? Quartz crystal is extremely hard. It is a seven on the hardness scale. Only emeralds and diamonds and uh, other gems like that are harder than quartz crystal. That's why you would need diamond tools. But certain ancient civilizations, like the Olmecs and the Zapotecs, had apparently the kind of technology it would have taken to make crystal skulls. They would have had to have 
iron tools. They would have had to have diamond drills and diamond dust. But we know from some of the Olmec heads, like the giant colossal heads made of basalt, that the Olmecs were capable of carving extremely hard rock and apparently quartz crystal as well. Frankly, in my work uh, with the Great Pyramid of Giza, I've noted that there are crystalline components within the granite stones, suggesting that there is a type of piezoelectric energy transduction that takes place. And on a great scale, I believe, with the work of others like Stephen Mailer, that the Great Pyramid is a type of energy generator. It's a process now of finding out on a more discrete level how these crystals may enhance even laser-like aspects of how the great passageway or the great ascending chamber of the pyramid could be a type of chemical laser process that was ignited and used by the Egyptians for energy production. Again, this is not a far-fetched theory. We have seen through our discrete measurements that under certain conditions, standing waveforms can be excited within the crystalline matrix of the Great Pyramid. And in certain rooms, actual energy bursts would take place. Standing scalar waves could be produced. Again, this is part of the new science of why we at the Academy for Future Science are looking at all of the pyramids throughout the world, those in Yucatan, those in China, those in Egypt, in Mexico, as representing a worldwide grid of information storage that as we tap into and connect, will as this way unfold a global memory of consciousness and point the way of human unity in the arts, in the sciences, and in the cosmology of life. Now, a crystal skull or any quartz crystal is, is, is really inert. It doesn't really, like a computer, it, it doesn't, isn't good or, or bad. It's, it's just an inert thing that can be used. And it could be used for bad purposes or, or good. But it itself is, it, is just a, a computer. So now you have this idea of these crystal skulls. Are they, are they good? Are they bad? Mike Mitchell Hedges called the, the, his crystal skull the skull of doom. He said it was a terrible, evil thing. Well, in general, if a crystal skull was used in human sacrifice and in some temple, yeah, it, it, it could absorb these negative energies. Uh, and, and therefore, people who are around it and sensitive would maybe feel, yeah, the, this skull was used to, for evil kind of things. But the skull itself isn't necessarily good or evil. As some of you may know, I had the opportunity to work uh, briefly with Marcel Vogel at IBM and Dr. John Maluski at Los Alamos back in the 1980s. And they were interested in memory storage properties of certain types of crystal. It was very clear from the onset that the use of lasers in a type of interface with the crystal matrix, high levels of information, terabytes of information could be stored and retrieved by the reflective pattern of signals, namely the signal laser and the reference or reflective lasers would create, as it were, a plane and by slightly altering the angle of incident, information could be retrieved on several levels. So you could stack a whole library of information, literally the round spherical crystal is the ideal matrix for storing, and I believe that as we go into space and establish our civilization on the high frontier, the crystal and form of information storage will be the ideal component that we will be using. Marcel Volgo re received his magnificent crystals from Brazil. They were air-free with no pockets or no, uh, shall we say, blemishes. These crystals then he divided in two, giving one to one of his colleagues, such as myself, at a distance of several hundred miles. The crystals could be used as tuning forks and mind over matter communication could take place, suggesting that there is a global brain that resonates at a certain frequency. Marcel was able to demonstrate quite effectively to great scientific groups throughout the world, including the use of crystalline uh, signal processors on our satellites in space, that they were the key really to a higher level of information transmission. So 
his process of cutting the crystals very carefully through special instruments he had on a micro electron level was very, very important. And his work is just beginning to be understood as a great legacy of what could be called a scientific priesthood, bringing together the paraphysical as well as the material science dimensions of this whole question of crystals as a living process of energy production. Marcel Vogel, by dividing the crystal and using it as a tuning fork for minds to communicate at great distances, demonstrates what we now know in quantum entanglement, where the subatomic particles split and recombine the communication processes, fuses itself on different planes of assembly. And so Marcel was demonstrating basically the elemental understanding of how, shall we say, the higher holographic nature of the brain works. Uh, the research of Dr. Dean Radin and others on quantum entanglement and all of those in the major think tanks is suggesting that there are areas of information storage and transmission that is very, very exquisite. The use of uh, crystalline communication devices is used to enhance the process of signaling information and processing at great distances and is the key to entanglement. Now, as far as some of the phenomena that we've observed with crystal skulls, there's been some amazing things that we can report. Sometimes in candlelight or very dim light, some of the crystal skulls, when activated by mind, used in meditation, glow or give off colors. Some people have heard sounds. Now, sometimes people have heard the sounds in their mind. Some people have reported this. They've heard the sounds auditorily, out loud, where others have seen. The most amazing thing, story, that's been told to me about crystal skulls, and what which I do not accept, is that some of the skulls, like the Mitchell Hedges skull, are actually fossilized human skulls. There was a channel who reported that the Mitchell Hedges skull had been the fossilized skull of an Atlantean priestess. Now, I heard that skull before I examined the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, but, but considering that I have a background in pre-med, a, a degree in physiology and anatomy, I have a pretty good uh, knowledge of the human anatomy. When I observed the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, first of all, I found errors. It is a wonderful representation, what we would call an anatomical study of a human skull, but it is not exact. There are mistakes. There are many mistakes on it. And, they have, and the eyes, in fact, are pointing in the wrong direction for human eyes. So that I stated then there's no way that that it could have been a human crystal skull that was crystallized. So that's about the wildest story I've ever heard about crystal skulls. But stories that people have told us about phenomena, what they've observed, scenes, jungle scenes, seeing dreams of the Maya, of ritual, of ritual sacrifice, all of these things have been reported with the crystal skulls. It's an interesting idea that the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull and, and maybe some of these other crystal skulls are really from Atlantis. Uh, Mitchell Hedges thought that perhaps the skull was a 12,000 year old relic and that it had been handed down to the Knights Templars and other secret societies. Mitchell Hedges himself was a, a Mason and a member of secret societies. Somehow he was uh, given the crystal skull in a special ceremony, perhaps even in England. And this ancient crystal skull from Atlantis was, was now you know, in possession of this famous archeologist and adventurer. In many ways, we may never really ever know where the famous Mitchell Hedges crystal skull came from. There are just so many different stories about it. Now, the triangulations that we see within the facets of the crystal skull, known as the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, and some of the other artifacts which reflect, for example, at Caracol, an ancient astrophysical observatory, are very interesting because in 1973 I detailed over Guatemala and Yucatan a very complex map that connected geophysical points where information was stored and coordinated. The findings of several of my friends who were doing deep sea diving off of Yucatan and off of Florida in finding certain crystalline artifacts suggest at one time there may have been some type of higher civilization that may have used these crystals for information storage and located them in triangulation patterns from Guatemala to Yucatan to Oaxaca in areas 
that possibly could be used as information uh, signaling devices. So the keys at Enoch tell us that extrasolar intelligence can monitor Mother Earth by grid patterns of information that are basically operating as transducers of information collection and, and signals processing. These are the crystals that are buried throughout the Yucatan and throughout parts of Guatemala that I feel will open us up to a treasury of ancient knowledge that there was once a superior civilization in the New World. Okay, the crystal skull in the future, we're, you know, there's a lot of interest in it right now, especially with the movie. But the, that, I think that is all because of this the period that we're in right before 2012. Things are happening. We did some major stuff recently that I feel is affecting uh, in a positive way uh, the earth and mankind. And that's, that's what it's all about. And so uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of traveling now. I'm, I'm going to Italy next month. I'm going to Virginia, I'm going to Colorado, then a month after that I'm going to Europe and, and like uh, Germany and Switzerland and France and uh, uh, so it's, it's a few different places but these are the people that seem to be drawn to it and I'm going to try to do the best I can to bring it to them. Uh, you know, I, like in April I had somebody come from Germany and spend time with me and then somebody flew in all the way from France just to spend the day. And so, hey, instead of having them come to see me, I think it's more fun. I'm going to go see them. And I, hey, as, as a member of the World Explorers Club, hey, I want to be his top explorer guy. <laughs> I'm going to explore the world. I think, well, you know, you know, for the Mayans who's, and the, the Hopi and the, you know, and the Egyptians to have this as an important period of time and, you know, putting this as the end of a cycle, it's not just a little thing it's a major thing because uh, and uh, we found that the the Mayans have been so accurate over the millennium of what what happens they're right on and so this 2012 thing is a major connection things are happening but talking to the the Mayan elders they say it's a end of a, a cycle an end of a yucca uh, there, it's like a tree they say it's like a tree and we've been in the roots of the tree and now we're going from the roots in this new cycle into the trunk. So with the crystal skulls being together, uh, with people working for universal love in their heart, it's my hope and my belief that we're going to go from this dark negativity that we've had into a light and positive time that we have a good future and people will have the real potential come out. Crystal skulls have affected me tremendously. I've been involved in the research since 1979. First saw my first crystal skull in 1980. Uh, they have changed my life. Uh, crystal skulls have, have manifested for me an affirmation of why I was on the path of metaphysics and spirituality. And particularly in 1983, when I worked with the amethyst crystal skull, it affirmed to me why I had gone on this path, that there was something more than just a physical science world, which I originally came out of. My background is in the physical sciences, and then I became a mystic in the 60s and 70s and got into metaphysics and metaphysical science. So the skulls have been an affirmation to me that there's more than what we think in the physical plane, that there's consciousness that exists, not only extraterrestrial, but interdimensional that there's consciousness throughout this universe and all universes. And on a personal level, Max in particular has impacted me on a personal level by bringing me and my wife together. And we met in 1997 at a gathering in Boulder, Colorado that Joanne Parks had brought Max. And Max put us together and told us we need to work together. And since 11 years we have. I've written three books with the help of my wife. She's written two novels, which I've helped give her information for, and we continue to work together. We do tours together. We're doing a Crystal Skull tour to Mexico next year together. And so Max is always saying to me, how are you guys doing? Are you working together? I put you together. So I always tell people, whatever else you think about Crystal Skulls, they also are matchmakers. They bring together a whole community of people who are involved in Crystal Skulls in this lifetime and maybe other lifetimes.